What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, listen what you think about the episode. If there's a particular question or guest or, or topic you want covered, we're always checking comments on YouTube. Love to be able to hear your guys' feedback and then be able to create a future episode out of it. Today, I'm going to be joined by a listener. He had sent us a video, and you guys may have seen it circul- circulating around social media. Um, it's of like a brand new F-350 or F-450, and someone's recording it on their cell phone, and they show the window sticker. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's for export or government use or something like that, but he puts the camera underneath the truck. There's no DPF on this brand new truck that, that uh, just came from the factory. So... We wanted to get his thoughts on that and talk about how the diesel community reacts to seeing things like that, knowing that there's these brand new trucks that come from the factory that are destined to go overseas or for other type uses that don't have some of the emissions controls on them. Um, And then also chat with him a a little bit about his experience, you know, with diesels themselves, um, you know, where he lives, what kind of things he's seeing with truck owners, whether they're new trucks, old trucks, and just have a really a really good conversation with it. So definitely looking forward to chatting with him. Before we get to it, though, I want to remind you, our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a 20% off site wide code just for diesel podcast listeners. We really appreciate them offering that to you guys. If you go to kershaw.kaiusa.com, use code 23diesel20, gets you 20% off site wide. We've got a ton of different choices for knives to meet really any budget, any type of use that you have. Their latest model is a Duralock model, which the blade's made out of D2 steel. The way that the knife opens and closes, it's super smooth, keeps your fingers away from the blade when you when you operate it, and there's a bunch of different designs um, and blade styles as well. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure to head on over, check them out, and use code 23diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Tony, chatting with him about the video he sent in to us, getting his thoughts, talking about trucks, diesel performance, and uh, you know the current state of, of diesel upgrades, modifications, performance, and what his thoughts are. Tony, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. I appreciate you listening to the podcast and uh, reaching out to us and uh, send us some you know, really interesting things that are going on in diesel right now. I look forward to chatting with you about them, learning more about yourself and your passion for diesel trucks and working on them and you know, getting your thoughts on what's transpiring in diesel right now. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. And tell me a little bit about yourself. Like I... I uh, I know you're really into diesel stuff. Um, a lot of the information that I get, you know, you sent it, you sent it into us, and I'm like, oh, I miss it. How did I miss that big story? Or how did I miss this? So where did, when did your you know, passion for diesel trucks and performance and, and everything did it start young? Did it start later in life? It started young. Um, my dad has always owned a construction company. We've always done construction and ranching and everything. So I've always been the first truck I learned how to drive in was a 95 65 uh chevrolet four-wheel drive at eight years old so i mean i've i've always been into diesels we've always had diesels around um we tow we haul we uh, we ranch and everything else it just it started from there and got into high middle school high school and the diesel magazine started coming out and i'm like that's my stuff (laughs) <laughs> so it's 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 always been a passion and then i got into college uh i had a gas truck was for my first vehicle but as soon as i could i bought a um what was it oh two cummins dodge cummins little three-quarter ton two-wheel drive and it just started from there just modifying it you know putting a straight pipe and putting that edge easy on it and then putting some injectors and then having trans issues. And it just, between me and my dad having diesels and then stuff on the ranch, you know, you want to use something and if it breaks down, you have to figure it out. So it, between growing up with them, it just, it's, I've always been interested in them. One of the things I really regret is that I wasn't around them when I was younger. And I feel like I lost time because I didn't really get into them until mid to late twenties. And I was always, it was always gas trucks, gas cars. It was, yeah. um, I remember one of the first trucks I ever really paid attention to was that square body Chevy with the 454 SS decal they had on the bed. Like that was the first thing it was the coolest thing. I look back at it now and I don't know how much power they made like 200 horsepower, 190, 210, something like yeah. that. But I got into them because I had a couple friends that were 
the one had a six liter, another had a Cummins. I'm like, wow, you can make so much power because they were just, you know, using a, a program. I don't know if it was a Smarty, and I think the six liter was an SCT or something. I'm yeah. like, you can get this much power out of them, and you know, you can get this kind of mileage, and the torque was insane. And so, I wish I would have been around them when I was younger, and just. I feel like I could have saved a lot of time and not purchased, you know, some gas vehicles or gas trucks. I did like, you know, early on and just got one of those early common rails or those VP 44 trucks or something like that. See, and I went to college for it too. So I got out of high school and my passion's always been mechanic. And, and it was either go into aviation, which that's way too much paperwork or go into diesel. So I went to college in a diesel went to tech school and it went, it went from there. And I know what you're talking about. Cause I had the gas truck. I had my, I had a Chevy 1500 long bed work truck. I mean, it was base model, just a, just a single cab long bed. And all my buddies going to school, you know, where I went to school, it was a bunch of rice farmers. So they had their power strokes and their Cummins and this and that, you know, ranch trucks that they drove to school. And I was like, I got to do something. So as soon as I got it, I was about halfway through college and I come across a really good deal on my truck and I bought it. <laughs> so that's where it really started. It's, it's interesting because once it's changed for me, I haven't really paid attention to any gas trucks that, that probably 10 or 15 years until recently, a friend of mine got a uh, Dodge Ram TRX. And I'm like, how cool can this thing really be? Until I went for a ride in it and I'm like, this is actually pretty fun for a factory OEM you know, truck that makes 700 horsepower or something like that. But I say it's get, supercharged, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's got, he didn't launch it, but it's, there's a launch control thing on it. And I thought this is really cool. But then you know, I think you can do that. You can make tons of power with a 20 year old Cummins or an LB seven Duramax or you know, any one of the power strokes that are out there. You can have a lot of fun with. And I think that's what really kind of brings this all together, regardless of, of the brand it is. And when we were chatting a little bit before the podcast, you're telling me about doing YouTube. And I really, I love YouTube because I've always used it to learn things. If I don't know how to do something, I go on YouTube and I watch a video with whatever it might be. Yeah. What's it been like for you starting a YouTube channel? Like what was, what was the first video? Were you super nervous, nervous doing it? How did it go? No, my first video. So I had to, to I did an auto manual swap. Not going to name the company, but I had a bearing put in backwards on a reman transmission. I'd got brand new. So it locked up and I'm like, I need a four wheel drive. I ranch and everything else. I mean, plan on going pipeline. I need a four wheel drive. So I got rid of it and I bought a 99. I bought it and I don't remember what year, but I bought it and it just. What was the question? <laughs> oh, was blank. oh, the the YouTube channel, like starting and doing YouTube your first channel. Video. Okay, yeah. can you edit that part out? <laughs> I will just keep going. <laughs> okay, uh, YouTube video. So I put airbags on it. I put airbags on it, and I was having axle wrap issues. So what it was doing, it was taking my center sport bearing, and I was having so much axle wrap, it was pushing my bearing up and out of the uh, the rubber. So after that, I put a uh, my GoPro underneath it, and I and I videoed it, and I was like, you know, I bet you other people probably have this problem and don't know it and can't find nothing on it because I couldn't. So because I put my airbags on there, it took the rigidity and it made the axle wrap a lot worse, which pushed my drive shaft forward and pushed the bearing out. So I did a before and after little videos of before and after truck bars and it just didn't do nothing for two years and then went from there and then got back into it you know doing kind of hey i had this issue doing this or hey i was working on a customer's truck i found this this is the issue this is kind of how you diag it and go on from there i think that's what's really helpful is it, it can be so kind of overwhelming like if you go on Google and you type in a problem you're having with your truck and you can find things to read, but it can be so hard to sift through the information and find it. And it might not even apply, but then you just spent 10 or 15 minutes going through things where on YouTube, you can just go watch, even have it on in the background, listen for the part where, you know, what you're really 
you know your truck's facing and check it out now with like different things that you put on there are people asking like are some of the people who watch it saying hey show this issue on a power stroke or show this thing on a Cummins or where do you get the the content from not that much um i have a few people ask i'm having this issue so where would you go with it yeah but my channel is only at like five something so i don't really get that much feedback i mean i get a little bit i mean i might get like two or three comments per video um my mainly most of my content is just from personal stuff i mean two weeks ago i couldn't find nothing i have a 7.3 excursion and the shift lever has a bunch of slop. I could not find no videos that just had to do with that. So I did a video on replacing the bushings in there and tell and how to get to it, tips on how to get into it, and just how to disassemble it, how to put it back together, and part numbers and stuff like that. And it's just most of my videos are just from personal experience. That's that's really cool. I think. I think the way that you describe doing it is that's so helpful is one of my one of my huge pet peeves is when I'm trying to find an answer on YouTube and somebody does something real quick or they don't give the part numbers or they don't yes. show something and I'm like oh man I saw you fix it but I don't know I couldn't really see what what the guy what was do? doing what yeah. did you do how did you get in there yeah what did you disassemble <laughs> yep yeah it, it definitely takes I think some skill and, and some thought to be able to think okay somebody's watching this on their phone I want them to be able to watch it and see it and know how to do it. So I think that's really cool. You take the time to, to be able to show that. And you know, one of the big things is recently there's always, you know, a ton of, I wouldn't say overload, but there's so much going on. We can access things on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, YouTube. There's just so much truck stuff that's going on. And one of the big ones recently that I've seen is this guy did a video with a cell phone and this, 2022 i think it's an f450 um dually that's on this flatbed and it's brand new has the the window sticker on it and he takes his phone he puts it underneath the truck and he shows that there's no dpf on the truck and the comments wherever i've seen it it's like people are erupting um a lot of them are upset that you can't go to a ford dealership and be able to buy this truck and then you know drive it on the street I wanted to get your thoughts on. It. I think you know you've you've seen the video. You know what? What do you think about that when you see that as a diesel enthusiast? I think it's not right. Um, us, we're going for a green initiative in the U.S. I get that, um, and I get how us diesel people too kind of feel like it's really pressed on us. You know, we spend between fifty to one hundred and ten thousand dollars on a truck. And we can't do what we want with it. We have to, uh, and I, I understand, you know, it has to be able to go on down the road. It has to be safe. But why can we, or why can the manufacturers manufacture these trucks for other countries and send them out? If we're, we are doing the green deal, why ain't we telling them, hey, if you want this, you're going to take it how we build it for our people for yourself and we're not going to do nothing special because it's made here like that. How are they able to manufacture them here when it don't even meet our emission standards? I think one of the things that uh, was a comment I read on one of the, one of the, wherever I saw it and somebody was talking about how it's unfair to take that truck. Like if you were to go to a Ford dealership, get that exact truck right now, but it's going to be in the U S not for exports, not for government use or emergency services. You know, you're going to pay a hundred, 110,000, whatever the price is on it. And you could have potentially issues with that system yet. If it's going overseas or to, you know, uh, other entities, they can't buy the same thing and have the same reliability that they're spending $110,000 on it. It just infuriates people when they actually see it. Like, I think it's, I don't know a lot about this topic, but I do understand that there's things that are exported that are different. And it's kind of always, you know, been like that. But when you can actually see that truck and you see that 2022 and, you know, Fords, whether we love them or hate them, they are the most popular truck and, and most purchased truck in the U S and you can't have that. You can't buy that. 
but it can go somewhere else. It just it, it riles people up a lot. And I totally get that. And they even have this issue in the in the uh, heavy equipment industry because that's what I do for a living. And it's just like some manufacturers. Like here, we have all the DPFs, the DOCs, the SCRs, and we just we have so many problems with def headers and everything else. And we're having it with equipment and trucks. And you go to Mexico, and these manufacturers are sending the equipment down there the same exact way as Ford is sending that truck overseas. Do you think? Do you think it's going to get to a point in the U.S. where you could? potentially buy a truck like that like do you think that the manufacturers the oems ford you know ram gm are gonna get that point where we can go on a dealership and they might have egrs they might have these other things on them but you don't have the current setup as we understand emissions components on a diesel truck do you think we'll reach that or do you think it's maybe you mean as in not have def and go kind of to where yeah. the non-def system but yeah. still have emissions compliant um yeah. They've got away with it this long. Why are they going to change it? So I don't think so. Because if they get rid of the deaf usage of trucks, then the guy who makes the deaf is losing money. And that guy is supported by him and probably gets a kickback. So it's one of them deals. You got to kind of follow the money on stuff like that too. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole new industry that, has arisen out of it that, you know, for some of the old timers been around diesel for a really long time. There were a lot of these companies and a lot of these products you never heard of. There, there was no need for it in the pickup truck world where we would hear about it. Whereas now, you know, I can go to almost any fuel station. Sure. You can't too where you're at and you're going to find no, DF fluid and you know, some of these other things over. that are there. So it's, I know it's definitely a, a complex issue and I mean, I guess I hope, I hold out hope that maybe one day it could be whether there's a new technology or multiple technologies where that reliability is back. Because I think that's the two main complaints I hear is one, I want the sound. So for the enthusiasts, they want to hear the exhaust on whatever new truck that they, they might. They have. want five inch yeah. exhaust. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, do. yeah. And the second thing is probably maybe more popular is they want reliability. They don't want to have to worry about a sensor or some other issue that can arise with it because I think the majority of them, you know, use their trucks hard or they can't afford downtime. They can't afford to drop it off and leave it at the dealership for a week. And then it becomes really personal because it's affecting somebody's business or livelihood, um, picking up their kids from school, you know, just living their life. And it's just such a polarizing issue because of that and how personal vehicle ownership is. And then coupled it with the, you know, enthusiasm that, uh, they might have for hearing the exhaust and, and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's really tough. And you don't forget about the back order parts. Cause I mean, try to get sensors. I mean, you could be two or three months without sensors and you're still making a truck payment on a truck that you can't use. Yeah. It's well, and the expense of it too. We were chatting a little bit about that yes. too. What it used to cost to, if you did have to replace say the whole exhaust system on one of the early trucks versus now it's a vastly different price tag that comes with it if you can Tenfold. get it yeah yeah if you exactly exactly if you can get it now do you find in working on trucks and maybe feedback from people you know do people tend to have less issues with these systems if they work the truck really hard versus someone who's daily driving it point a to point b you know warming it up in the morning i can personally attest to that i can personally say from experience with pers or personal pickups that the family owns that if you idle them and you just sit in AC for a couple hours a day, you sit on job site, you sit out in the field, you see you sit in town putt putting through traffic all day, and you're not hooked to a trailer or running 80 mile an hour down the interstate, getting these trucks warm and making them work, you're going to have issues. With being your DPS plug in, you have SCR issues, or your EGR is plugging up. If you use them, they run good. And they're a lot more reliable because you can look at a truck that's daily driven around town and stuff. And he's going to have issues, a lot of issues from soot and everything built up and everything up because he don't use it to clean it, to burn it off. 
where you look at a hot shotter and they're the ones that are having sensor issues, stuff like that, but not having actual components go out like the EGR plugging up. They're not having that. They're not having DPF plugging up unless there's unless say they have an injector going out and making more soot plugging it up, but they're having that type of issues, not just from not working it. So yes, personally, if you work your truck, it's going to be more reliable. How would you say that compares? And I asked you, you've been around diesel trucks longer than I have, and you've owned some of the older ones that I didn't is I don't remember a lot of, guys older than me talking about like issues idling their vp trucks or their early common rails or their seven three power strokes but i hear it a lot now with the newer ones um especially like in a cold climate or something like that and you're not really towing because i i think somewhere along the line i was probably also part of this is i didn't have a need for a diesel truck i didn't tow i didn't haul i just wanted one because i wanted the engine and i wanted i really liked it so I was that guy who would go point A to point B, um, idle it, you know, when it's cold. But I think, I think maybe that would be a lot of the, or maybe part of the reason why those older trucks have a tremendous amount of interest. In them. Well, like the because older ones, there's, there's there's simple. Yeah, it was simple. You didn't have EGRs. You didn't have all these. All the sensors. I mean, you didn't have all the, let's say it, just, you didn't have the missions issues. It's just where it started with the island issues was like with the 6 with the EGR cooler plugging up and stuff like that. Before the mission systems, you didn't have the island issues because for all that to work correctly, you have to use the truck. So if you just, say you pipeline you form and just it's hot i'm going to take a break and get in the truck and idle it it's not going to hurt them older trucks because you don't have to get them up to temp for them to do a certain job of burning something off or keeping something clean it's just a basic engine with the ones say the newer ones that you see that are either you know around here or they're on um you know, job sites things like that would you say one of them in your experience is more reliable or are they all pretty equal between ford ram gm or or what would be your experience as far as working on i'm kind of biased toward cummins because they're they're simple it's, it's less moving parts it's less sensors it's less gaskets it's less seals i've heard it to me it's maintenance if you do your maintenance right and you take care of your truck, you're going to have less issues. But as far as reliability, I've just, other than a 6.7 having the head gas, or 6.7 Cummins having the head gasket issues, you don't have to worry about oil pans leaking. You don't have to worry about cranks breaking. You don't have to worry about the, really the valve covers. You got one valve cover to worry about, and it's up top. It's not hanging off the side. Um I'm kind of biased toward Cummins because it's just simpler, simpler ask, designed engine. I wanted to ask you about those for a second um, with the transmissions. So in you know, your experience, are the, the people that own them, are they keeping them relatively stock with power? And if so, do you see the kind of 68 failures that, because it, it's got a horrible name in diesel performance. Like you say, you got a 68. Some people will avoid buying that truck, even though they love a Cummins, they will avoid buying it because they don't want a 68 RFE. But I'm wondering if it's more a performance <laughs> sort of issue versus working it hard every day at stock or near stock power levels. Um, personally, we had <clears throat> my dad owned a 07, 67 with a 68. He's bad about maintenance or was. He's good about now. <laughs> and we never service that transmission. Never. And it's just it just truck was worked every day. He put three hundred thousand miles on that truck and never had a transmission issue, not one. And it and it it was turned up a little bit, and but we never had issues. But I think the main problem these days with um, the sixty eights is 
people are putting big rims and tires and they're putting more power to them, whether it's a message president or however they do it, they're not regearing them. If you regear it for what you got, I see it lasting a lot longer because you're not putting the added load on it. I mean, it's, but from what I understand, it's a double overdrive transmission. So if you don't keep it out of the top gear, out of sixth gear, you're you're going to burn it up if you overload it and you don't have the right gearing. The gearing part is, is really interesting to me because I remember a time when it wasn't talked about a whole lot in, in the diesel side. And now it is. And I think that's been a tremendous help with – 68 RFEs and some gear companies that I've chatted with over the years and even enthusiasts, sometimes listeners, they message in and they're like, Hey, you know, I've got the turbo, I've got the injectors. Um, I'm in the market for gearing. What should I do? So I think it's really helpful that that's become a, a major topic to understand where your RPMs are sitting at with larger wheels and tires and trying to keep it in balance and, and not stress other components, which, you know, it's pretty expensive to, Rebuild that's exactly and that's exactly what's, hap what's happening is you're stressing them the double overdrive and the planetaries and i'm not very familiar with uh, automatics but um you're just like you said you're just stressing stuff that is kind of fragile yeah it, it's, it's helpful to hear that because you know a lot of times with um you know hosting the diesel podcast a lot of it's performance driven and so i, I always like to try to talk and and learn from people in different parts of the diesel community which is really varied because on the performance side you always hear well 48 swap it or buy a 5.9 you don't want to deal with 68 rfe but you're not the only person i've ever heard tell me hey this stock 68 has lasted for a really long time but it's not being it's not a race truck it's not running compound chargers and going down the track and but this you know, truck was towed heavy i mean yeah. it towed heavy but we also didn't have oversized tires we didn't really – we used it, but we didn't abuse it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's all about how you drive. It's drive style. Yeah. I mean, you, the old man that has a, a stock truck is going to have a longer life out of one than the young guy who just wants to go fast. <laughs> what would be what would be your dream truck, whether old, new? What would be the perfect mm -hmm. truck, in your opinion, for you? I'd like to have two. I got two. The first one would be just a brand new loaded out four door long bed, one ton single wheel Dodge with, you know, go ahead and head stud it, do some stuff to it, you know, build the trans, gear it, just put a missions present tuning to where you're not messing with nothing and drive it. Cause I mean, even with a missions present tuning, you can have five. I think almost 600 horses yeah. on a pretty much stock truck. So why not make it to where you can road trip somewhere and not break no laws? Yeah. And uh, they're getting better fuel mileage and stuff, which that'd be number one, uh, you know, loaded out Laramie leather interior, heated, cooled seats, you know, bushy stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Number two is I have a 99 and I had a 53 block failure. I mean, it cracked from the back to the front and I pulled it March, May of 2020 and just haven't had the funds to build one for it. And I mean, I got a DNJ head sitting in a, in a crate in my shop. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get the head and this and that. I'd like, my dream truck is to put that thing back together because, I mean, I have a Firepunk Stage 1. I mean, a, a Dana 80 swapped it. I have full gauges, fast, full is pro gauges, brand new AC system on it. I mean, it blew cold and hard. And I'd just like to get that truck back up and going. So that one and a brand new one would be nice. I'm right there with you. I think I would do something very similar. Yeah, I think it'd be really but tough to pick between because i would be torn between i've always loved the mega cab so like a 3500 mega cab or like an f250 f350 it'd be really tough to pick but then i de i would want an older one i'd want one to have fun with and it gets really and tough that you can modify legally 
yeah, you can have some fun with it. Because this one, I had uh, 363 SXE. I mean, I had a steed speed manifold. It was studded. Had Infinite Performance uh, injectors in it. And, I mean, for what it I just had an edge easy for programming. And, I mean, it would run. I mean, it with, with trucks that had stuff done to them on the interstate, it'd run. They're fun trucks. And, and it, what's so cool to me about diesel performance in general is how you can have an older truck and you can make really, you know, depending on the platform, which engine it is, as much power as you want with it. There isn't that limit with it because the aftermarket is so vast, especially on, you know, talking to Cummins trucks. Like, what can't you do with a 12 valve or 24 valve or, you know, a 20 year old common road? There's there, the sky's the limit. And that's so cool to be able to be able to do that. And it's, I think that's why it's one of the, one of the most popular trucks to go back and purchase. Like when people talk about wanting to buy an old one, I hear, I hear three things. I hear, I want an LB7 because I think because they're simpler than some of the later Duramaxes and, and people like I them. just, I don't like the injector <laughs> setup. I hate, we, we personally have one here, and it's making all. Yeah, they're. So, I mean, it's. It's it's. I think that's what I love about the older ones. It's just they're simpler, and you can have some fun with them and and do it. But I, yeah, I was really curious. I always like to ask that question: What's the one that you would pick? And I mean, having sat in some new ones, ridden in them, checked them out, yeah, there's so much stuff inside of them that's so cool. The materials, the interiors, all the technology. It'd be hard to pass that up to take on a road trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially compared to some of the, actually, the earlier ones. The, the actually, we just fixed that one. It was making oil, and we just fixed it. Um, return lines. Uh, re- re- replace the little copper washers on the return lines. Blow back to the return. No more air coming out. Return yeah. lines leaking. In the area that you're in, do you see a lot of the, you know, a lot of the guys that are working these trucks hard? Is there would you say an equal number of Ford Ram GMs or does it tend to be more of a Cummins area or more of a Ford area? What do you see where you're at? Where I personally live is in a big area. And, um, I mean, we have all the dealerships. I mean, we have Ford, GM, GMC, Chevrolet. I mean, we have within 30 minutes of me, we have two Dodge dealerships, two Ford dealerships, one G or one or two GMC dealerships and one Chevrolet dealership. So, I mean, where I'm at, we're, I'm in a big industry area because we have a, like, we have four plants within 30 minutes of me. And so we have a very good economy where I'm at. So we see everything. I mean, you see it from the rust bucket, old truck to a ton of brand new trucks. That's cool. It, it always fascinates me the different regions, which ones maybe maybe popular um, in those areas. I don't know why I'm so interested, but like when I, I um, travel Southern California, I'll see a ton of power strokes. Go to another area, it's a ton of Cummins trucks. Some other spots, I see more Duramaxes, and it's it, I'm always interested. Like, well, why is this one more popular here than you know in this other area? So I think it's cool. You got it sounds like a pretty much an equal number of kind of all of them. It is. It, it really point. is. I mean, and there's one, two, there's like four, three or four aftermarket, not aftermarket, but non-dealership diesel shops in my area. I mean, so, I mean, it's, we have the business and we have the economy here to have plenty of stuff That's cool. from the poor guys to the guys who have the Denali's and the ultimate, like you see a lot of just base model trucks running around. And you see a bunch of just loaded out American forces and stuff like that. I mean, there's, you can't even count. Wow. That's cool. And you're, you, I think you were saying you're pretty close to PPI. They're just like right around 30 the minutes away. Like <laughs> from my house, 40 minutes. It'd be cool. To... I mean, he's close. And I, I know, I know most of the guys up there. <laughs> I'd love to just, I, I need to plan it sometime and just go check it out and hang out and see all the cool things they do on the dinos there and the, technology and the things they're doing with new trucks are always pushing the envelope with uh performance and you know, giving people what they want with new trucks old trucks even they're tuning other things besides trucks so it's a, it's amazing 
how much effort that a bunch of our tuners are putting into doing stuff legal. And they're doing really good with fuel mileage and helping reliability and def usage is down and everything else. And it just seems like with them hopping up these trucks and making them run more efficiently, you make a you make a I mean, you make something run more efficiently, everything else is gonna do better. Your DPF ain't gonna have as much soot in it because your engine's running cleaner. So it's 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 cool that your EGR is gonna stay cleaner. It's cool how they're doing that. And it's actually helping these systems by having emissions present tuning. Yeah. Yeah. That's been a really fascinating part for me watching it and seeing how that's progressed so much and and what companies like PPI are doing. Um, And this isn't like a sponsored ad or anything, but just like what they're doing with pushing these trucks forward, the power levels, the things they're doing with transmission tuning. Um, I think they just did some stuff for the 10 speed Allison and a lot of this other stuff so i I always get excited seeing that because that's the gateway to performance we all start if it's an electronically controlled diesel we all start with the tuner whether it's like the old edgy z you were mentioning for the vp trucks or smarties with the common rails whatever it might be that's how we ended up with compound turbos a built transmission back in the day (laughs) yeah back in the day stuff That's really cool. It was it was really cool to to chat with you, Tony. I appreciate you reaching out to me. I appreciate you, sh- you sharing the things that that you did. Um, I love learning more about you know yourself, what you're doing, the YouTube channel, and then I just love to sit around and talk about what's going on. You know, with you know, like the video we talked about with that that 450, or you know, just just be able to get people's thoughts because I know there's gonna be a lot of people out there that agree with us. Might be some that disagree. Might be some that you know hate the new trucks. Might be some that. Um, don't like 60 R fees, but it creates a conversation and we, we, you know, we all love these trucks for whatever reason we do, whatever brand we're a fan of. So I appreciate you reaching out to me, chatting, taking some time this evening and, uh, that's no problem. Yeah. Keep us up with the, keep us updated with the YouTube channel, things you're finding, things you're seeing out there. It's, uh, you know, it's great chatting with you and yes, I look forward to seeing, uh, yeah, how you do on YouTube and, and how things grow for you. Uh, my YouTube channel is T3 Diesel Repair on YouTube. So if y'all want to make sure and like and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, people should go over, check check out, uh, drop some comments. You know, let you know uh, yeah. what, what they want to see, what what they're looking to see some videos on. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 23diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. It's a great way to be able to save some money, get some really cool gear if you need it for hunting, fishing, EDC, uh, something to use around the house or job site. Their latest model that they have is a Duralock model, which I've got a couple of them myself. Um, I need something just to you know, carry in my pocket or you know have around the office and, and stuff. And the way that the blade the way that it opens and closes is super smooth. Um, there's a bunch of different choices for handle styles, uh, blade shapes, and the, the blades themselves come out with D2 steel, which is you know really nice um, to be able to have that uh, that type of blade still on a EDC knife or something. You know you're gonna carry every day or, or use every day. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure head on over check them out and use code 23 Diesel 20 for 20 percent off site wide. Also want to also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen of 23 Diesel, J Cole John. On all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube, podcast apps, follow us on social media or on our Discord. We appreciate all the support that you've given the podcast here in year seven and look forward to bringing you even more of the content, topics, and guests you want to hear from in 2023. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.